Good evening, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to our very first After Dark Online, which is a new education series we have launched for students, teachers, and anyone generally interested in the project. Before we begin, I'd like to the traditional owners on the country and the place of meeting and recognizing connections to the lands, waters, and their communities. Pay our respect to the First Nations peoples, to the elders, past and present. Today is World Creativity and Innovation Day, and to celebrate, we're bringing to you what innovation means on this project with our special guest, Russ Fine, who is our lead innovation officer here at Cross River Rail. I'd now like to hand it over to Russ for today's live stream. Thanks, Jack. Hello, everybody. My name is Russell Vine, as Jack said, and I am the Cross River Rail Delivery Authority's lead innovation officer, and I have got an awful lot of innovation to share with you guys. So I've called this presentation Seizing the Innovation Opportunity and really that's exactly what we try to do here at Cross River Rail Delivery Authority is we try to capture and foster and realise as much innovation as possible. So what I'm going to do, to do, do in today's presentation is we're going to talk very quickly about what Cross River Rail is. I'm just going to quickly show you how we're going building it. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about our commitment to innovation but what I'm going to spend most of the time doing hopefully is I'm going to run you through um, some of the innovations we've realized already and some of the in innovations we've, we've got on the go. So let's see how we go. Okay, so Cross River Rail. So Cross River Rail at its core is a new railway line through the middle of Brisbane. Um, it's uh, 10 uh, kilometers of rail line, 5.9 kilometers of which are twin underground tunnels. And uh, the underground component goes in just after Dutton Park. So there's a brand new station gets built at Dutton Park to replace the existing Dutton Park station. Uh, the twin tunnels go in, there's a Boggo Road underground station, there's a new underground station at Wollongabba, there's a new underground station at Albert Street in the heart of the CBD, there's a new underground station underneath the existing Roma Street train station, then uh, the twin tunnels do a big right hand turn um, and they pop out in between uh, Vic Park and near the grammar schools in uh, the top end of Brisbane and then um, uh, they go above ground and there's a new station above ground at Exhibition which is at RNA Showgrounds. So that gives you an idea of the project. Um, we're also rebuilding six stations to the south of Dutton Park between Fairfield and Salisbury. So these are some of the oldest stations in the rail network. Um, they're going to have more train services than ever before going through them now that we've got that second rail path through the, through the middle of the CBD. So they're going to need um, upgrades. They need to be improved in terms of accessibility. Um, because uh, Cross River Rail means that you will be able to run more trains up from the Gold Coast as population grows and, and as you have a need for more services. We've also been asked to deliver three brand new stations on the Gold Coast at Pimpermar, at Hope Island and at Merrimack. Um, and uh, because uh, Cross River Rail gives the South East Queensland Rail Network additional capacity, it nearly doubles the amount of trains that ultimately you can run on the whole of the network, we've been asked to put in a new signalling system, a new world-class signalling system. And then last but by no means least, we're also expected to consider and worry about who else will build what else around each of these stations. So around, in particular, the four underground stations, which of course are in the core of the CBD. So that's very exciting to think about after we've built the underground station, who else can build what else above ground. Okay, so um, how are we going building it? Okay, well that's not the topic of today's presentation, but I thought I'd give you a quick look-see. The twin tunnels are built. So these are the twin tunnels that are already run from Boggo Road through to Wollongabba. And at Wollongabba, we have the station box and the station cabin already excavated. We go under the river, under Kangaroo Point Cliffs, we go to Albert Street, where likewise we've got the station cabin and the station box excavated. We go up to Roma Street, so basically straight under King George Square and Queen Street Mall. The twin tunnels continue up from Roma Street. We get to the northern portal, and that's where the twin tunnels pop out. So all of the twin tunnels and the majority of the station boxes and the station cabins are now fully excavated. Um, so with the Northern Portal, that's what it looks like. That's what it looks like right now. So there's your twin tunnels um, that's heading in. So if you walked into either of those tunnels um, right now, you'd be able to walk all the way to Roma Street, underground, all the way to Albert Street, under the river, all the way to Wollongabba, um, underground all the way through to Boggo Road, and then you'd pop out at the Southern Portal. Um, obviously, not for much longer, because we're going to put some rail tracks through there, and then there's going to be trains running. Um, inside those tunnels, you can see we've put in what's called an invert slab and we're getting ready to run rail through and take out some of the uh, temporary infrastructure in the tunnels and start putting in the permanent infrastructure. And at each of the major underground station sites, there's four, as I said, 
um, there, there's typically a large station box where we've excavated down and we're getting ready, so, and we'll then fill that with station. So basically you'll walk in at a ground level and you'll go down three or four in some instances, escalator roads, maybe off through some tunnels, so you can see some tunnels being excavated there, some passenger tunnels to the right of that image, and then you'll get down at each of the station sites into a station cavern, okay? So you can see the twin tunnels there, so that's uh, Roma Street, I believe, and that would be the twin tunnels from Roma Street, probably um, either heading north back up to the Northern Portal or southwards back towards Albert Street in the centre of the CBD. Um, and as I said, we've got to rebuild six suburban train stations uh, south of Dutton Park, uh, build a new uh, train station, a ground station at Dutton Park and Exhibition, and build three new stations on the Gold Coast. So we've actually got 15 stations to deliver in total, so we've got an awful lot of station uh, and stations to build yet. Okay, so that's the scope of the work. Okay, not, the, not the, um, the, the topic we're covering today, though. The topic we're covering today is innovation. What's Cross River Rail Delivery Authority's commitment to innovation? Well, right at the outset of delivery, and we went into delivery in 2017, um, we said that our uh, innovation will be our first and foremost definition of success. We said that groundbreaking and industry changing levels of innovate, innovation would be a definition of success for this project. But also when we talk to people who work at Cross River Rail and we talk to our major contractors and we talk to staff and we say, what do you like about working at Cross River Rail? What's good about working on a big railway project like this? The chance to be innovative comes through really strongly. They feel that this is a chance to sort of do things differently and um, to maybe consider how things could be done better than they've been done on previous projects. And so there's a real sense of opportunity uh, on Cross River Rail that, you know, this is a chance for, uh, for, for the, one of the largest infrastructure projects the government has to, to set new levels when it comes to, to innovation. So we have a process. We have a defined process for it. We don't just sort of um, just hope that we're going to innovate. So what we do is we appoint innovation champions. So I'm the lead innovation officer and I am very lucky to be supported by, at the moment, 14 separate innovation champions who all represent different functions. Some of them are engineers, some of them might be in project management, all sorts of different fields. And what we do is uh, those guys each have to go away and find and discover and come up with anything and everything we, we could do moving forward that would merit the, the, the phrase innovative. What, what could we do that if we did it this way, not that way, people would say, oh, well, that was quite innovative. Well done, that's a good innovation. And then what we do is, and so when we do that, we put them in, a, in an innovation register, and there's somewhere in order of about 90 possible innovations logged in our register. Then what we do is we evaluate and prioritize, where we say, well, will this cost money? Will it save money? Um, is it already planned or is it not planned? Um, is it scheduled into the program of works or would it have to be scheduled into the program of works? And what we try to do is we peer review all those innovations and we say, um, which ones would have the biggest impact but be the easiest to achieve? And of course, they're the ones you put to the top of the pile. You go, biggest impact but easy, easiest to achieve, low hanging fruit if you like, they're the ones we'll do. So then you need a process to get that idea through to reality. So we have a pipeline, pretty simple. It, uh, ideas go into the pipeline as ideas. And an idea is literally that. Someone might go, do you know what? I've been thinking, rather than do it this way, I thought, what if we did it this way, okay? An idea turns into a concept when you add to that idea, when you say, okay, all right, so break that down. What does it mean? What's it gonna take? How would it really work? Is it really feasible? And then a concept goes into development once there's a commitment to explore the concept. And actually someone says, do you know what? We're gonna set some time and some money aside to investigate this. We're actually gonna do this for real. Then you get your, your innovation to a pilot stage, so you actually, create it um, and pilot it and if it works and it proves itself then it might go into a launch or a trial phase so what you do is you move them along so back in 2020 we had 16 possible innovations that we identified fit to go into our pipeline i won't go through them all i'm going to show you some of them in a second and show you show you how we turned out but you can see in there there's all sorts augmented reality step gap prototyping design review software all sorts of weird and wonderful things so don't worry about understanding too much what's on that slide um, the key thing is, is that we've been able to get 14 of those 16 uh, since then through to reality, which we're very proud of. So let's explain a few of them. Well, this is one of my absolute favorites, laser markers on plant. So plant is what the construction industry um, uh, says when they mean machines or big machinery, okay? So a big digger. And a lot of our machinery has to be lowered into the ground and has to work in a tight, confined space, okay? So um, absolute genius idea to stop anyone being hit by the swinging arc of the, um, of, the, of the digger or the bucket of the digger arm, there's a laser beam creates a circle that creates the, the no-go area for workers. So you can see our worker there in the picture on the, on the right, he's, uh, he's carefully avoiding the, uh, the identified area he's keeping in the safe workspace. Okay, so I love that innovation. 
Um, we've been doing it. It's become absolute standard on our, on our project. Completely different thought. There was a, a guy on uh, one of our major contractors who, who, who uncovered uh, this company that made a thing called EnviroSand. It's, it's sand, the kind of sand that you use on building jobs to bed in drainage pipes, uh, made out of recycled glass. So when we go and do our recycling at containers for change and stuff like that, we're, we're only actually capturing a small percentage of the, the world's total recycled glass. A lot of it is in industrial quantities, um, and that glass in industrial quantities is now captured, ground down, and turned into an alternative for sand. It drains better than sand, it's cheaper than sand, it's uh, easier to use than sand, and of course it's fantastic for the environment. So a really good, uh, really good innovation. Not all innovations are physical or necessarily particularly complicated. This is one of my favorites. On our 2D engineers' drawings, they have begun to add a QR code. And the reason you add a QR code is because if you're looking at the drawing and you've got your phone and you scan the QR code, it will tell you which version of the drawing you are looking at. And it will also help you find all the previous versions and all the files that are associated with that drawing. So it's almost like a little you know, authentication tag that means you can instantly begin to access digitally the additional information that goes with the drawing. And as you can imagine, version control on documents and knowing whether you're working on, on the latest plan is super important when, uh, when you're working on a project as big as Cross River Rail. Um, from the relatively small and mundane to the absolutely huge and significant, um, one of our major innovations is in rebuilding Dutton Park train station, we had to deal with the fact that it, it sits on one of the worst track curves in the whole of the Queensland um, rail network, and therefore it is currently a station where the train is quite often, the entrance to the train sits furthest away from the platform edge. So we've completely redesigned that station with a number of innovations and a number of engineering solutions so that we can try and reduce that step gap. And we had five goes at it at all, and there's a whole separate video which we can, we can provide a link for if anyone's interested about how we, how, we, how we match that challenge. And that step gap that exists, another innovation that's been added to the mix of these little, um, it's called step gap prototyping, but they're, they're rubber fingers. They stick out at the edge of the platform edge and they basically mean that they reduce the gap but without having to extend the platform as a solid surface between the train and the platform. And they're particularly important for people who need uh, things like wheelchair access for trains. So we work with our accessibility reference group on, on that kind of innovation. Um, sometimes it's as simple as saying, how about we just do things differently? That's innovative, to change the way we do things. So this is a, a bit of a, a, bit of a, a stodgy looking um, you know, flow chart of process, but this is actually an absolute game changer for us. It's a, it's a gate process for how we plan and affect our works when we know we're going to disrupt the existing public transport network. So on occasion, we need to ask for rail tracks to be closed down or roads to be closed while we move machinery around or traffic to be diverted. And this is a gate process that we've put in place to streamline how we get from knowing we need to do it to pulling it off as an actual, um, uh, as an actual event. Um, and then uh, what you're actually looking here is the uh, front page of my performance development review. So if you're tuning in CEO, feel free to go in there and give me a big uh, gold star. Um, but um, a lot of our processes that used to be paper-based, where people would fill in a form, or where you'd type in on a document and you'd save something, well, they've been, um, they've been, they've been essentially uh, um, reinvented as automated forms using Power Apps, Power App BI, which is a, a software tool that allows everything to sit in a system and to be interactive. So you can fill in your, your form and you can press lodge or submit automatically. And that's, again, been a, a, a big efficiency driver for us across the whole of the organization. Um, completely different. GIS web mapping. So as you can imagine, we, we're pretty obsessed with looking at 2D maps of the area of, of, of Brisbane as a geographic area. And just like you can look at a Google map, sometimes we like to look at a Google Earth type view, a photographic uh, reference, as you can see there. But the big game changer for us is just like Google Earth can become Google Street View, is getting from 2D to 3D. So you tilt the perspective and you begin to see the Brisbane landscape as a 3D rudimentary landscape. And then you can understand your built environment that you're going to build. So that's the Wool and Gabba station that doesn't exist yet, hasn't popped out of the ground yet. Um, and you can see what it's going to look like uh, applied into a, a, um, a, a rudimentary 3D um, uh, surface representing Brisbane. Our major contractors are on board, so we get them to tell us about their major innovations. So the guys who are all, the, all of the big construct, tier one construction and engineering companies we work with. So they've got a pile cropper device that cuts the top off uh, six piles simultaneously. So piles are like little steel rods that stick up out of the ground um, after you've sunk a big pile in to support where you're going to excavate down. 
and traditionally someone would have to go and cut them off one at a time. This thing comes down and chops all six off simultaneously. The innovation for when we transported our, our tunnel boring machines um, through the middle of Brisbane in the dead of night was that we lowered the truck. We had to create a new ultra low truck so that the bits of machinery could fit under the gateway bridge. Um, Albert Street, we have got some pretty, uh, pretty clever ideas for how to mitigate against uh, floods because as I'm sure you all know, uh, you know Brisbane is, is a flood prone city. How we tag tunnel workers used to be manual with in-out actual manual cards is now an electronic tagging device and how we cut the cross passages between our twin tunnels is now done using a single rope saw maneuver which the engineers informed me is highly innovative and has cut down on plenty of labor. Um, few on here that I really like, Railview. Um, someone's put a 360 degree camera on the front of a train and instead of looking at the entire rail corridor as a 2D map, you can now go down and see it as a 360 degree 3D environment. There's those rubber fingers again, HDP pits, whole heap of stuff. Now, the reason I'm blasting through those is I wanted to have some time left just to talk to you about 3D uh, digital modeling and what we call project DNA. So some of those inno innovations that were in some of those lists at the top of the presentation, they talked about DNA. You might have seen one there that said flight center. That idea of 2D to 3D GIS web mapping. So project DNA is digital network approach. It's basically our commitment to have a 3D model of what we're building that after we've built it will be a digital twin of what we've built, okay? So a 3D model that we use while we're building something that once we've built it for real will be a digital twin that can be used to operate it. And when you model things in 3D, you're going from a 2D plan to a 3D um, environment. You can also do 4D and 5D, which is you can model time and money. Quite a complicated process. And you can do 6D and 7D, which is you can then model performance and operation, okay? Won't get too deep into that. Let's show you something instead. This slide normally kicks in round about now. Whew, there we go. So um, this is what a federated BIM model looks like. So basically a building information model, too long twins. Oh, it's not working too well. We'll get past that. And there's that merge of the BIM model data with the GIS photogrammetry, which basically lets you see the engineering model sitting through a 3D Brisbane. But that 3D Brisbane's not so sharp, okay? It's not so great. So we need to do a bit of work with that. So we take all that data and we put it in a gaming engine, okay? Gaming engine we put it in is Unreal. About 50% of the world's top selling uh, uh, computer games are, 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 are made using Unreal. Um, ours, unfortunately, isn't a computer game. It's a, it's a 3D model of Brisbane within which we can turn off buildings that no longer exist and we've demolished and turn on buildings that we've not yet built. And because we've got all of the data from the BIM model, the architects and in engineering models, we can get in there and we can get in there in quite some, some, some detail and we can traverse the whole thing. Now, once you build a 3D digital model of the thing that you're building for the future and you've got eyes on being able to um, have a digital twin of the thing you've built once you've completed constructing it, well, things get pretty interesting in the innovation space. So flight school is simply um, a uh, initiative where more people in the delivery authority know how to fly the model using an Xbox controller, okay? It's as simple as that, but it's an absolute game changer. Geo-specific panoramas are where you can hold your phone up and you can see on your phone what you're currently seeing with your real eyes will look like in the future. So the, the phone serves you the model version of what things, something's gonna look like in the future and you can compare it. So a bit like AR, a bit like Pokemon, um, that sort of uh, use of application. Um, of course, if it's a 3D digital model, you can spawn yourself into it uh, first person wearing a headset. So that's Jordan from our team there in the corner. He's in the office, but he's not really. He's taken himself off to exhibition. He's got off the train at an exhibition station that's still two years away from existing, and he's decided he's going to set the Echo Fireworks off this year. So we can have a bit of fun. And there he goes. Look at him. Woo! Okay. Um, once you start running a camera through a digital model, then what you can do is you can post-produce that footage. Uh, you, know, you can edit it, you can add graphics, you can add words, you can smooth out the difference, you can animate the people. And also the other thing, of course, is you can drop below ground, which this video will do for me any moment now. And there she goes. Okay, and then you can understand the, uh, the subterranean aspect of the project as well as the above ground aspect of the project. Um, something we've done, I'm talking to you uh, uh, today from the Experience Center, from the Cross River Rail Experience Center, and something you can do here at our Experience Center is you can go into our mixed reality theater, and we will use a 270 degree uh, ceiling to floor screen and a five-way projector system to project that 3D model around you. And that means that you don't need a headset. It means that groups of people 
can be in a future built environment that doesn't exist yet at scale, navigating themselves using an Xbox controller and contemplating whether this is going to be fit for purpose. Are we happy with the exit routes? Are we happy with accessibility? Are we happy with the escalator paths? Are we happy with, with the built environment that we're aiming for? So an absolute game changer for us. And then this is one of my favorites. There's another digital Brisbane we've ever partnered with, um, uh, which is called Virtual Songlines. And in Virtual Songlines, everywhere in Brisbane is as it was in 1819, which is before any colonial settlement. So basically, we can understand and appreciate the cultural heritage of each of our station locations. Or as I like to say, we can not only learn about travel, but we can travel through time. So we can go forward to 2025, and we can come back to 1819. And then a few more just to finish off with. Uh, we can pull through actual genuine real AR, not just fake AR. So this is an engineer at exhibition using his mobile phone, holding it up to contemplate what he can see and using the slider on the left to turn the, um, the, uh, the built environment on and off that will get built yet. And then this is fun augmented reality. This is a 3D uh, model of our tunnel boring machine, which went under King George Square, reimagined as to what it would look like if it went over the top of King George Square, which basically eats pedestrians, which is quite good fun. And then two more to go, first person driver training. So obviously, once we've got our model of our entire project, we can basically recreate what it will be like to drive a train through the twin tunnels. So this is all about letting train drivers understand how they'll operate trains through the new rail infrastructure years and years in advance of that being a reality, um, which of course is a fantastic opportunity. And then sort of last but by no means least for the, for the project, all of this means that we can ask ourselves, well, if we have a digital model of a train station, how will that help us operate the train station when it's been built for real? So, um, you know, what aspects of the digital twin will allow us to, to, to make it a truly a smart station, uh, which is, becomes really interesting. And then I've got one tiny little party piece to finish on, which is we're now actually um, working with uh, a number of partners uh, within state government to see whether this model could be used to visualize Olympic outcomes. So this is, uh, this is not um, what is definitely being built at Wool and Gabba. This is an imagination of what an Olympic sized Gabba stadium might look like by 2032. Um, push, pushed into the model um, just to get the conversation started. So that's it. Hope that's been useful. Hope that's been um, informative. I hope that's been inspiring. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Jack to close out. Thanks, Jack. Thanks so much, Chris, and who's joining online as well. And if you do want to check out our VR, we do have it here in the Experience Centre, which we're filming from today. Also, too, um, when we're out in the community um, with myself um, with our events kit. So um, if you like what you see today, please remember to like and subscribe for more. And our next After Dark online will be for Archaeology, um, National Archaeology Week, focusing on archaeology, of course. And that's going to be in May. So make sure you check out our website for further details. Thanks. Bye.